My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Agricultural Extension Agent here in Prince William County. Today we're going to talk about garden principles. So the first thing we want to talk about is right plant, right place. Here we have two pictures taken the same time of year, roughly the, the distance between DC and Myrtle Beach apart. If you thought about it, which would be the right plant for this place? Naturally, you'd want to think it's the one on the left with all the nice green grass, not the scraggly, almost dead-looking grass on, on the right. The actual answer, though, is the, the scraggly-looking one. These were taken in February. Go back for a second. Uh, both of these are in a desert climate. The nice green grass is in Kabul. The scraggly stuff is in Helmin, which is in southern Afghanistan. So it's February in a desert environment. Now, cool season grass, you would expect in February to be kind of green, but the only way that this grass stays green is by lots and lots of water, way more water than they should be using on grass. Um, so the scraggly looking one, it only looks like that for, for a month, maybe a month and a half out of the year. The rest of the time, it looks like it does on the left. Very green, very lush. It's very good at self-repairing itself. Right plant, right place. And so when we're thinking about a garden, we need to think about our space and the plants that we want. Are they a good fit for that space? It's important that you research the plants that you want to grow. Because if you don't know what the plant needs, if you don't know how it grows, what it's supposed to look like, what its life cycle is like, your chance of being successful is very limited. If you're going to do an internet search, you want to search the plant name, and then after that you want to put site.edu. And that will bring up university sites that are based on research. Seed catalogs also can have a wealth of information, even if you are buying uh, plant starts instead of seeds. Those seed catalogs have a lot of good information on culturally on plants, especially vegetables, but ornamentals as well. And so in the bottom, you have an example of how you would put in a, a search. We want to group plants with similar needs together, and this reduces our maintenance. This helps conserve water. This allows us to reduce our management, and we have more time to enjoy the plants Hello. instead of working on them. So one thing you want to think about is how much sun do you have to work with? Full sun, we consider eight or more hours of daily sun. And then you need to think about there are some plants that do really well with full sun that need more than eight hours. Some plants need partial sun, which is six to eight hours. And some plants need shade. Some plants also need direct sun versus filtered sun. All things to think about when you're planning, what do I want to grow and do I have the space to grow it in? Space is really important um, in terms of how big is this going to get? I see a lot of times, particularly with our vitae being planted very close together and people not realizing that our vitae get you know, 20 feet wide. And so the plants grow together and they start having disease and insect problems and they've wasted the investment that they've made. So how, it, do you have the space for what you wanna grow? And if you don't, you need to think about well, what's most important. Now you can modify or mitigate space problems using trellising, but that only works really for vining plants. Then you need to think water. How accessible is your water? You really don't want to drag a lot of water great distance, particularly in the summer. You need to think about how much water, how much more water you're going to have to put out for plants that haven't fully established yet. Plants that haven't established need more water and more tender care. That's true whether they are vegetable starts or whether they are, you know, 
uh, saplings. You have to make sure that those young plants get enough water so their roots can establish and they can be successful. Now, a lot of our perennials can survive on the water that they're given through nature. However, you may still need to water in times of drought, depending on the plant. We are seeing a lot of issues with trees that are the result of many years of too much water, actually. So that's another thing you have to think about. Think about drainage as well. You don't want to plant a lot of things that need well-drained soil in a place that's going to be wet most of the time. Speaking of the soil, you need to think about that as well. The soil is our most important element because the soil ecosystem helps support our plants. And so one of the things that you want to think about right away is, do I have the right pH? If the pH is off, then nutrients will be locked up in the soil and plant unavailable. You need to think about how much available nutrients there are in the soil. Does the soil drain well? And how much effort is it going to take to improve the soil? So one of the things we always recommend is a soil test. The soil test helps you keep track of what's going on chemically. We recommend using a reputable lab. Virginia Tech has one. Uh, shameless plug there. But um, there are other labs you could go through. The reason why you should go through a lab is that, say, for example, your pH is out of whack. Well, a lab can tell you how much lime to add to fix the pH problem. If you have a meter, it'll tell you what the pH is, but it won't tell you how to fix it. With heavier soils, we recommend every three to four years doing a soil test. If you're in really sandy soils, then you want to do it much more often because sandy soils don't hold nutrients as well as heavier soils. If you don't understand your soil test, talk to your local extension staff. They'll be happy to go over it with you and explain what's in the soil test and what it's really saying. We want to use the soil test to base our fertilizer and lime applications. Applying fertilizer sort of willy-nilly, um, applying lime without really any understanding of how much you actually need, both of those things can cause problems. Too much fertilizer is bad for the environment, but it's also bad for the plant. Excess growth can attract pests. Too much lime can drive the pH up into a very alkaline situation that's really difficult to fix. You want to measure your garden area because when you get soil test recommendations, they're going to tell you in the case of gardens, typically it's in a, how much, how many pounds of product per 100 square feet. So if you don't know how many square feet you have, you can't really figure out exactly, well, this is telling me to put down two pounds of nitrogen per 100 square feet. If I don't know how many 100 square feet, I don't know how much to buy. And remember, with lime, lime is not an annual application. If you get a soil test and it tells you to add lime, you add that lime, and then you wait three to four years, get another soil test. And if it says to add more lime, then do it then. Most of us here in Northern Virginia have to deal with really bad soil. Um, subsoil is most of what we have here. A lot of the topsoil has been stripped away. A lot of the soil that we're left with is compacted, doesn't have a lot of organic matter in it. It's not a very hospitable place for plants to grow. It doesn't have a lot of biodiversity within the soil. The soil ecosystem has been disrupted. So let's look at the picture here. If you look at the soil where the glove is pointing, that soil that's been amended after one year, the other soil, the big hunk that's in the middle of the picture, that's the parent soil. That's taken oh, probably uh, 10 feet away from where that garden bed is. And the way we got from that red clay to that nice brown soil 
is by increasing organic matter. And we did that with adding compost and we did that with using cover crops. The other thing that will help your soil is to minimize tillage. You don't need to till every year. Tillage can disrupt microorganisms in the soil. And when you disrupt that ecosystem, it makes it harder for plants to succeed. So you really want to back off of plowing as much as you can. I understand with certain crops, it's really hard to not till. I mean, how do you get potatoes out of the ground if you don't till, dig them up, right? So you want to minimize that tillage, but till when you need to, add organic matter. You want to keep the soil covered throughout the year. The best thing you can do for your gardens, particularly your vegetable gardens, is keep something growing in them throughout the year. That's going to help the soil ecosystem. That soil ecosystem, those microbes there, are making things plant available. It's working in symbiosis with the plants. It's using the solar energy that's coming down into that area anyway and keeping those populations up. And it's also helping with uh, preventing erosion if you've got the soil covered. Try and have some plant diversity. Nature hates a monoculture. The more different plants you have put together, the more diversity there is above ground and below ground. That helps keep the environment in the soil in balance. And when it's in balance, you don't have massive pest problems. You might have some pest pressure, but you won't have pests out of control. The other thing that you want to do, or don't want to do rather, is don't work soil when it's wet. If your soil is too wet, you're going to compact it, which is going to take away from all the other things that you're doing to try and fix your soil. And we all do this in the spring. We get eager to get out, want to do something in the dirt, and end up, if we're not careful, end up working the soil when it's too wet. And so we damage our soil instead of helping our soil. Think about hardiness. Is the plant that you want to grow adaptable to the zone in which you live in? USDA has hardiness maps for the whole country. This is just the one for Virginia. You know, some plants do better in certain hardiness zones than others. Some varieties of the same plant will do better in certain hardiness zones. But you need to research your plant and make sure that you understand where it can grow, especially if you're talking perennials. If you're talking annuals, it doesn't matter so much. Um, but you still have to be aware of how long it takes to grow. Peanuts, for example, peanuts are perennial if you let them. We grow them as annuals because we collect the, the peanuts. Even though we're treating them like annuals, Northern Virginia is a little bit high in the hardiness scale to really have enough of a summer for peanuts to grow to be harvestable. So again, it's researching the plant and understanding where that plant fits in ecologically. Then there's wildlife. If you plant it, something will come. Whether that something is a good thing or a bad thing, sometimes suggest, subjective, sometimes it's really apparent if it's a bad thing. For example, the picture there is sweet potatoes. And you can see there's a lot of sweet potatoes that have been topped, and that's groundhog damage. That's at our teaching garden in Bristow. And unfortunately, we've had some issues with groundhogs. And so you need to think, Okay, if, if I'm attracting the wrong kind of wildlife, what can I do to help shield my plants? And sometimes it's a matter of caging. After we had this damage, we installed cages around the edges of the bed. That helped a little bit. Um, wildlife are clever, and some of them are very determined. Also, sometimes we want to attract wildlife. We want to bring in songbirds. We want to bring in pollinators. And so that's part of your research, what plants, or excuse me, what wildlife is attracted to the plants that I'm growing. We also need to plant our plants right. The biggest problem I see in Northern Virginia is things getting planted too deeply. And it's really important that you think about how plants supposed to grow. So trees, for example, have a swell at the base of them, kind of where the stem and the root come together. And that needs to be elevated above the soil. Unfortunately, a lot of times that's buried in the pot that you get from the nursery. 
and you take that and you bury it deeper and you run into all sorts of problems. It's not problems right away, but problems that will dramatically shorten the life of that tree. You also want to carefully inspect the plants that you get before you purchase them to make sure that they're not carrying pests, they're not, they're not damaged, they're not carrying disease. And also, as I mentioned before, with newly planted things, you want to make sure they get adequate water. You want to make sure that they have plenty of water to establish themselves. So one of your plant options are native plants, and native plants might not be as showy, although our native red, eastern redbud is a very showy plant in certain times of the year. Um, they have evolved to local conditions. The local pollinators, for example, are very evolved to deal with those plants. They need those native plants as a good nectar source. Native plants are generally more drought tolerant. They, um, they're better for feeding wildlife. They're much better for total ecology. Um, there are certain cultivars that have been grown or that have been imported that look really showy but they don't provide any food for our wildlife Oops. so one other bit we'll throw in about non-natives and natives um, a lot of times i get calls about um how do I know if something isn't GMO? Um, so let's talk a little bit about heirloom hybrid and GMO. So first of all, there are only a handful of GMO crops allowed in the United States. The seed for that is expensive and it's generally not available to the non-agricultural retail market. You are not going to go out, generally speaking, and be able to buy genetically modified seed corn would be the problem corn would be the most likely thing that you could buy but it would be expensive and usually it's agricultural seed dealers that are selling it it's not the general retail market um, i see a lot of non-gmo stickers on food where there's no gmo uh, plants but they're only a handful i think it's nine i think it's up to nine now crops that are allowed to be GMO in the United States. So GMO is not something, if you're concerned about GMO, it's not something you really need to worry about in getting GMO seeds. Um, heirlooms are cultivars or varieties that you can collect seeds from and plant those seeds and reliably expect them to be similar to their parent plants. They've been bred for a long time. They will breed true. Hybrids are crossbreeds of different heirlooms. The problem with, hi so hybrids have, are good and bad. Hybrids can be bred for say disease resistance. But in terms of seed saving, if you take those hybrid seeds that you've collected from your garden and you plant them, it's genetic roulette as to what you'll get. You may get some that breed back true. You may get some that are really weird um, I see this a lot of times in hybrid tomatoes. I've seen hybrid cherry tomatoes where as an experiment, as an ag teacher, we would plant the, the seeds that we collected from the previous year. And sometimes we get cherry tomatoes. Sometimes we get big tomatoes. Sometimes we get bushy tomatoes. Sometimes they're viney tomatoes. We get all sorts of different things. And sometimes they just will grow to a certain height and then just kind of peter out because they don't have uh, the resistance that the hybrid does. Another thing to think about is pest management and we recommend integrated pest management or IPM. And what that really is, is identifying what the pest is, scouting to see how many pests you're dealing with, if we're talking insects, if it's disease, how extensive is, is the disease? And then determining, do I really need to control this? And if I do, 
I choose the control that will do the least harm to humans, wildlife, and the environment. So if we look at the picture here, that looks bad. Um, if we were to think that that is a disease and start spraying fungicide, that would do nothing. This is sun scald. This is just a function of that being, this is basically sunburn for those peppers. The week before they were uh, clipped back, this particular pepper was exposed to sun where it wasn't before and it basically, it's got a, itself a sunburn. With that pepper, you could cut away that white area and the rest of the pepper would be fine, but this isn't something you need to treat. It's really important to understand if you have a problem, what is the cause of that problem? Because it's easy for you to just pick a product, apply it, and it not necessarily do anything because it's treating the wrong thing. If you need help identifying pests, we have a horticultural help desk that can help you figure out what's going on and make control recommendations. When it comes to using pesticides, if that's what it takes to control um, the issue you're having, you really need to leave, you really need to read the label. The label is the law. And so you legally, you cannot use a pesticide other than the directions on the label. One of the pesticides we see that gets used quite a bit illegally are mothballs. Mothballs are not allowed to be used outside. And yet I have people telling me that, oh yeah, I put mothballs out. Um, so it's important that you read the label. It is a contract between you, the person who manufactured it, and the US government that you will follow the label when you buy it. Understand that organic pesticides are still pesticides. They are not harmless. Um, they may be less toxic in some cases. In some cases, they might be just as toxic as a synthetic. It's important to wear the proper PPE or protective, personal protective equipment as directed by the label. And for most chemicals, that's going to be long pants, long shirt, gloves of some kind, shoes that are not, um, are not going to absorb the pesticide. Going out in your tennis shoes and spraying your grass is not a good idea because that pesticide is going to get in your shoes. Later in 2021, there will be a pesticide disposal event. I don't have the details on that yet. Later on this week, we're actually going to have a meeting about where and when that's going to be. Um, so if you've got extra pesticides lying around, something you might want to think about, disposing of those. And again, read the label. I cannot tell you how many times I've run into issues where people have made a problem worse by not reading a label. Actually, last year, I had a client who applied an herbicide that was only supposed to be used on warm season grass. They applied it to their fescue lawn and killed it. If he had read the label, because it said right on the label, only used for warm season grass. So you just have to be careful and you have to follow the instructions. Let's talk about pruning. Why do we prune? We prune to improve or maintain the structure of plants, to get diseased or damaged material off the plant, to increase airflow. And sometimes pruning can help with flowering and fruiting depending on what particular plant we're talking about. So we want to prune the right way at the right time. We have an excellent pruning video that, well, let's see, that class was two weeks ago, I think, maybe three weeks ago. Um, that's up on our YouTube channel that has really detailed instructions on how to prune correctly. But you want to use sharp tools. You want to clean those tools between plants so you're not spreading disease. You want to cut at the branch collar using a three-cut method. So if you look at the diagram that's there, you make a first undercut, then you come back and you do a second cut, and that 
takes heavy weight of the branch off and then you make a third cut right at the branch collar and that allows the tree to repair itself over time it makes it much much more healthy than if you do something like make one cut and it will potentially depending on how big the uh the collar is or excuse me how big the limb is it can rip down the bark so i suggest take a look at the youtube plant or the youtube video on our website and uh see how to do pruning right you also want to do research you also want to do research on your plants to know when the right time to prune them is different types of the same plant like hydrangeas for example may be pruned at different times of the year virginia cooperative extension has pruning calendars for trees and shrubs that are available and they'll give you a time of when the best time is when not to prune So in summary, we want to make sure that we're using the right plant at the right place, we're fertilizing appropriately, we're planting things correctly, we're choosing natives when po possible, we're using integrated pest management to control our pests and to do the least harm, and then pr pruning correctly to keep our, particularly our woodies, healthy. With that, I've got some resources for you. Um, that are listed here. Uh, one is natives from the Department of Conservation and Recreation. How to plant a tree is an excellent publication that is good for trees and shrubs. Um, other plant lists for natives are from Plant Nova Natives and the Virginia Native Plant Society. And then there are a whole lot of uh, publications from tech that you can download for free. This list will go out with um, the survey in a couple of days after, we, uh, after we're done. And that way you don't have to worry about scribbling these down. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to questions. Who's reading the questions today? Uh, I thought it was Nancy, but. We pretty much have covered the questions in the chat. Oh, okay. Well, if anybody has other questions, now would be the time to do it. Did you get the right, Sharon, did you get the website for pruning? I have one question. Um, this is Paula Hollerbach. Uh, I planted yellow tulips last year uh, in an area in front of my home and then discovered how much the squirrels liked them. And they immediately ate tulips. And I've been advised to get chicken wire to place over the tulips when they uh, bloom again. Um, I have seen landscapers have a very structured form of chicken wire that they put in front of the communities that protect all of the plantings. Where do you get this? Hmm. Um, I just Googled that squirrel protection for tulips. And there are a number of products out there. Um, you might even look at a, at, use those search terms and then put .ext after it. .ext? Yeah, so you get an extension publication that shows you Ooh, okay. how that, so squirrel protection from, for, for bulbs, maybe put that in the search term and then put dot .ext. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You can also do Google images. I found a bunch of options, but they would, they would not necessarily be the best. Well, I think the chicken wire is going to be the best, but I just yeah. don't know where the landscaper buys them. They're like, you know, large chicken wire um, frames. They're not something that you, you know, run off a spool. And I don't know where to buy those frames. Thank mm. you. Okay. 
I have a question. Um, where is the closest Virginia Tech where I could take that uh, survey to see if my soil is, well, I know it's crappy, but <laughs> to where I could get it tested. I, I live in Fairfield, Virginia, which is right outside of Lexington, Virginia. Is there so, a- Yes, a um, I'm trying to think of what county you're in. I'm in Rockbridge County. Okay, in Rock, there is an extension office in Rockbridge. Okay. Um, generally, there is an extension office in every county okay. in the state. Um, if not, you're close to Rockingham, right? Uh, no, Rockingham is, uh, well, I mean, probably 40 miles away. That's Harrisonburg, right? Yeah. Um, I was going to say. I'm, if... I'm like an hour from Virginia Tech, but I don't want to have to go all the way there if, if there's something closer. Right. I, if Rock. The, if Rockbridge can't help you, I'm sure they can, but if for whatever Okay, reason, I'm in between Rockbridge and, and I'm, I'm near Augusta County, which is probably a bigger county. Is there yeah, something I was going to say, yeah, Augusta has one as well. Um, okay. And what, do, what do I do? Just look on online, type in Virginia Tech County. Uh, Thomas, Thomas type, this is Leslie. They're on the VMGA dot net website on the I far did. right at the thing on the top there is a drop down that'll give you every unit in virginia and how to reach them okay thanks okay. leslie great yeah. thomas you. you have you have a few questions in the chat box now uh are there any resources on how to get rid of bermuda grass effectively um, i might send him a uh, some instructions on that so i think we're good well i i would say that <laughs> there okay. There is no way to get rid of Bermuda grass effectively. Um, but yeah, well, if Nancy has your contact information, we'll, we'll send you some stuff. Bermuda grass is very difficult to get rid of. Other questions? I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, mosquitoes. My, my neighbors and my husband have been talking about uh, having a contractor come uh, around this time, I guess, is the best time to get rid of mosquitoes in the summer. Um, but I'm afraid, is, would that also harm the other good insects? Um, I'm trying to convince them that that's not the best way to go, but I'm not sure if I'm right either. <laughs> um, it depends on what product they're using. Um, if they're using a larvicide that is targeted towards mosquitoes, then yeah, it's not going to be a problem. If okay. they're trying to kill adult mosquitoes using some other sort of insecticide, that's probably going to be a problem for your pollinators. Okay. All right. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, let's see. As I look through the chat box. You see, um, Thomas, there was a question about rabbit protection for azaleas. Yeah, that's what... Um, Let's do the rabbit one first. So rabbit protection, your best option is um, chicken wire, basically chicken wire fences. Um, they don't have to be terribly tall because the rabbits hop, they don't jump a whole lot. But you do want to um, have them L out at the bottom where the, the L is going outward away from your plants and use... Um, landscape staples to hold them down and that will prevent the rabbits from trying to dig underneath. Okay. Let's see. Uh, the other one was about, I'm sorry, Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles are a bit tricky because the best, the best time to kill them is when they're in grub stage, which is after that year. Japanese beetles have come and done all their damage, um, and you have to kind of scout underneath the ground to find out where the Japanese beetles are and kill them then. But for the adults, um, there are insecticides that you can use. Ideally, you want to use them on non-flowering or plants that aren't in flower um, to make sure there's not collateral damage. See, There's for... also a question on, is there any advice, special advice for using raised garden beds? 
Um, it depends on what type of advice we're talking about. Generally with raised beds, you want to make sure that um, you break up the soil underneath them and amend that soil with a little bit of compost because what you don't want is, say, for example, you've got thick compacted clay. You put a raised bed on top of it. You fill that raised bed with nice, loose soil. What happens when it rains is that the water will infiltrate through that nice, loose soil and then hit that clay, and it will take a lot longer to infiltrate, and so the water ponds. And when the water ponds, it basically is going to drown out the roots if it ponds too long. Um, that would be... So that would be my big recommendation is make sure you disrupt the soil underneath. You open up that soil and amend it with compost and then put your raised bed on top of it. Right. And then I thought I saw somebody ask something about. Crops. I think I got that one. No, there was something about um, that was related to raised bed, something about um, improving their soil. Yes, there is one. That was okay. the next one. Okay. What is what is that? It says how to do how do you deal with clay soil that is very deep? I can amend the top six inches easily and I use raised beds, but I run into a terrible drainage because of the depth of the clay. Yeah. Clay soils are, are will take time to open up. My best suggestion for that is um, well, first of all, it depends on whether we're talking about a, a, a perennial bed, an annual bed, or a garden bed. With a perennial bed, it's just going to take time. With annuals, you have the option of doing a cover crop over the winter, and I would use daikon radishes for that because daikons are excellent at breaking up clay. It will take several years to do that effectively. Um, but they will break down they will get down below six inches, um, especially if you plant them earlier in the fall and give them time to grow. Amending with compost as much as you can. Unfortunately, natural processes don't take or yeah, don't aren't instant. They take a little bit of time. Um, you could theoretically if you had a really good tiller, you could till that area up, amend it with compost, and that would help. But it's hard to get down below eight inches with a tiller. <laughs> Skunks. Skunks. Skunks digging. Um, so... If you have skunks digging, you probably have a grub problem. Not for long. <laughs> um, that is true, but skunks will – I've seen some golf courses where skunks have just ripped up greens and fairways because of grub yeah. issues. The downside of grub issues is there's only a small window, basically the month of August, at least here in Northern Virginia – where you can effectively treat grubs. Other times they're either too deep in the soil or they're too mature for the insecticides to really be effective. Um, but a, you know, a standard grubicide like uh, Grub X, for example, um, would be an appropriate treatment in, in August. Ideally, you'd like to get the grubs before the skunks come in. But it will help with your Japanese beetle and mass chafer beetle population <laughs> next year. So there's a bright side. Deb had a question about protecting saplings from deer tree tubes um, for until the for its second year. Yeah, tree tubes are helpful. Some people will make a little cage of chicken wire, which is a lot more work than a tree tube. Um, or, or you could plant um, thorny things in between your trees and use that as a natural barrier. Uh, but yeah, deer are a problem with, with saplings, and so you have to be careful and protect those with tree tubes. Great questions, huh? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. I'm looking to see if there's anything else. Do you see any, Linda? I've been trying to keep up with you guys. Um, Woo. I, I think we pretty much got it. Uh, I think there's the one just popped up with what's put on milkweed to keep white, a white bug problem. Oh, it's probably aphids. Yeah. Yeah, aphids. It's aphids. Yeah. Just hose them off every day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, I see one. Do I need to be careful about planting wildflower mixes on my drain field? Um, it depends on what flowers are in them. If they're really deep rooted, then you probably don't want them because you don't want them being, you don't want them getting into um, your drains. But if they're relatively shallow rooted, then it shouldn't really be a problem. Generally with drain fields, it's trees that are the problem. Let's see, uh, you have a, somebody has a vole issue. Um, how do you keep them from eating your garden? Um, I would look for areas where voles hang out, you know, protected areas like mulch that's really deep. And voles have trails and you can usually run those trails back and find out where they're kind of hanging out. Um, snap traps like you would use for mice um, are really effective at them. Um, you would put them in the raceway um, that they're using to get to your garden. Okay. Uh, basically, they are mice, so, you know, um, they're very effective on those. I had one question, Thomas, in the chat. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was embarrassed to ask, but I have three lilacs that were planted sort of 10 or 15 feet from these called water holding tanks. They're not the septic field, but they the water goes in and then it pumps it up the yard, under the driveway, over to the septic field. And it's an Irish peat system. And I made Glenn and I move two of this, um, and I left one little lilac, but no educated, like EDU information said it was a problem, but I moved it. What is your opinion? Um, as long as it's not, you know, as long as they're, they are piped directly and it's not like in a drain field where you've got open pipes to distribute the water, that, uh, that shouldn't really be a problem. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm seeing what type of bait to use for vole traps. Um, something non-toxic. Um, peanut, butter peanut butter is probably the easiest to use. Um, let's see, what type of compost to use for a vegetable garden? Um, <laughs> pretty much any compost, any decent compost will, will work. Um, just make sure it's fully composted so you're not adding weed seeds into your garden. What did, what did you decide on the drain field planting wildflower mix? Um, just make sure you're not planting things that root too deeply. It would be ideal if you knew where the, uh, where the drainage tubes were because if you plan away from the from where those actual two, the the piping is, then you don't really have to worry about it too much. Most of those wildflower mixes are annuals. Yeah. There's very few that have perennials in them, so <clears throat> those roots aren't going to be real extensive. Yeah. Um. Let's see. There was a question um, about any where besides the parks that someone could find a garden bed available. Um, it really depends like on your locality. Um, there are some some churches have it. Um, I some it. Thomas, I could send. Yeah, if it's Prince William County, we can help you with that. If it's not, it's, try and talk to your local extension office. 
So if you want to send an uh, email to mastergardener at pwcgov.org, we can get you the list of the ones in, if you're in Prince William. Uh, let's see, there's a question about ho hornworms. How do you get rid of them? I like to, uh, I like <laughs> to let the tacted flies take care of the problem for me. Um, they're the things that produce those white little tic-tac sort of things on the backs of hornworms. Um, they are actually killing the hornworm in doing that. Um, but if you're overrun with hornworms, um, they do glow in the dark, so you can use a black light. Um, but I would pick them off and either drown them in soapy water or, um, put them in a bucket and leave them out for the birds. How about, uh, did you answer planting vegetables over drain field? Oh, no, I would not plant vegetables right. over drain fields. Okay. Um, does clove or garlic actually repel rodents and other small animals? I have not seen any research that shows that it does. <clears throat> Although clove oil is used in some insectic some organic insecticides. Uh, let's see, Rachel's having issue with groundhog. Uh, um, a a groundhog is in my experience, groundhogs have been really persistent. Um, there's fencing that you can do, um, but you know, that groundhogs can climb over things. Groundhogs don't like things that are unstable. Um, so if you arc the fencing back, you know, the, the groundhog will climb up and then it will be going up and, and its back will be towards the ground and it will get freaked out by that and it will not go farther. Um, but the flip side of that is that groundhogs are rodents and they can chew through pretty much anything um, if they're really determined. Groundhogs, um, the trapping groundhogs is the best thing. And let me just say, if you're trapping an animal on your property Unless you have a permit from the Department of Wildlife, it is illegal to transport it off your property. So that means if you trap a groundhog, you have to then kill a groundhog. Um, which is all very well and good if you're in an area where it's easy to use a firearm to do that. If you're in a, in a neighborhood, it's, that's not legal either. Um, you're better off calling uh, a wildlife removal service, have them trap it. They have the license to take it off site and they will humanely kill it. Other questions? I'm gonna have to move. <laughs> um, let's see. I think this is the best discussion we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Great discussion. Let's see. It almost feels like it's in person. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, Grace mentioned that chickens lo love hornworms. Yes, yes, chickens will like hornworms if you give them to them. Um, Most birds at, well, actually all birds at some point in their life eat insects. Um, and so if you have a big bucket of hornworms um, and you kind of put them out in an open area, chances are that there's going to be some bird that's going to come and take a meal. Anybody else? Um, there's a wildlife rescue. Do we have that number um, or that name handy, any of you? I don't have it handy. Um, you know, a lot of, there, it, what about the um, zoo up in there's a Blue Ridge? What about Blue Ridge Wildlife? I don't yeah. know. Let me see if I can find it. 
Wildlife Center, Blue Ridge Wildlife Center. Okay, I'll put the, um, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, uh, let's see. I keep my moss yard completely clear of debris. I let natives spring up through the moss. Am I damaging the soil or robbing of its nutrients? No. Mm -hmm. um, quite honestly, moss can survive. Moss can survive on on uh, concrete if you give it mm -hmm. enough water. Um, mm -hmm. So you're not really robbing from that. Let's see. I understand it takes years for lime to change the pH. It doesn't necessarily, it, so the question is, why does it take so long to take for Lyme to change pH? There are several reasons. Um, and it depends, on, it depends on the soil itself. There is a lab test they do called a buffer index, which basically tells you how much Lyme it's going to take to change your pH. And if you have a buffer index that tells you a lot of lime, then it's going to take a lot of time. Um, but generally, it is going to take months for that to happen. And the reason for that is that the change is both chemical and biological. And so depending on when you apply the, the lime, you know, if, it's, if you only need a little bit of lime and you apply it in the spring mm -hmm. where you've got moisture and you've got warm temperatures, it's going to do it much more quickly than if you apply it in, say, December when it's colder. And so uh, microorganisms are less active, chemical reactions are slower. Um, that's kind of what you need to be happening is warm, moist, and biologically active for Lyme to be as, as effective as possible. Um, let's see. Thanks, Linda. That's a yeah. good app. I forgot about that. Oh, yeah. The Merlin app for uh, bird ID from Cornell. Yeah, that's good. Um, Thanks, Leslie. Yep. Yeah. 5.3. You see that one about the... Yeah, I'm looking at... So, uh, Cher has a soil test of 5.3, buffer index 5.7, amended with compost and added lime. Whoops, it's going too fast. Um, larger tomatoes still won't grow. The question I would have is, A, how much compost did you add? And B, how long ago did you add the lime? Um, and how much lime did they tell you to add? I'd have question to know that. C. Question but, C might be, uh, when was the last time they planted tomatoes in the same place? Well, there's that too. Um, good point, Linda. Um, Cher, if you could just send us an email we can, with some details, um, we can do a little research and help you problem solve that out. For that master gardener. She signed off. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> Great questions. Any suggestions to move a peach tree that is overgrown and too close to the house? Chainsaw? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, when it, when it comes down to it, um, if it's overgrown and it's too close to the house, it's probably too big to move. Um, so just cutting it down and, and if you really want to have a peach tree, you know, replanting a peach tree somewhere else in the yard. Oh, it's getting colder out there, John. So that looks like that's our last question. Um, thank you all for coming. And you have other questions, send us an email at mastergardener at pwc.gov, excuse me, pwcgov.org. There's no dot between PwC and GOV. Um, thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you next week.